Good morning. Some might wonder why I'm a little late. Lisa was doing such a great job. I just wanted to continue. No. I apologize for being late. Uh, this, uh, we had gathered together, those on Zoom and YouTube, to uh, come and praise our risen Lord. So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We rejoice because we come today on a communion Sunday to share our love and our faith and to partake as a community of faith in this wonderful time. Uh, but first, are there any announcements this morning? No, no, I don't see any announcements except for Sue. Go ahead. I need to use my hands. <laughs> What's that? I need to use my hands. I have a That's place fine. here. Okay. Um, Elizabeth Groff, Groff was born and raised in eastern Ukraine. She grew up in a broken family and ended up in an orphanage when she was only seven years old. Groff was devastated by the tragedies in her family and felt very alone. While Groff was in the orphanage, she received an Operation Christmas Child shoebox gift. Because of the gift, she began to have hope that God would not leave her at rock bottom, but that he would meet her there and become her family. Um, I got to hear her story, and um, she, got to, she had the opportunity to return to Ukraine in order to distribute the 200 millionth shoebox for Operation Christmas Child to a special little girl recently. And so we're going to start. Um, I have shoeboxes back there, plus a few papers I just want to let you know about. Um, instead of putting them in the shoebox, you could pick what you want. If you would like to pay for shipping online, you can use this um, label for your box. And um, then when you enter your payment information and email, they'll send you an email and tell you where the shoebox was distributed, what country. Or if, and then you can take this brochure about how to pack your shoebox with some ideas. And if you want to just um, make a check for shipping, to put in the shoe box made out to Samaritan's Purse, you can just use this label. And then here's just a brochure and on the back, shoe box gift ideas. And then these are always a lot of fun um, for the kids to get. You, I mean, even if you're not a kid, I fill this out. It's just about me. And um, if you, sometimes they write back and if you wanna put like the church's address down here, you could. So anyway, and then I was just thinking this morning, um, because we had to put our 21-year-old cat to sleep on Friday, that my cat has more food and toys than a lot of these kids in earthquake areas or orphanages or war zones. So anyway, so anyway, if you want a shoebox, and the collection week is November 12th, or that's when they come back to church, and then November 12th, right? And then I'll we'll take them to the church collection church sometime that week. Okay, super, super. So I really encourage people to do the shoebox thing, and uh, that would be a wonderful for all those people, all those young uh, people that get it. That'd be great. Any other announcements? Uh, again, just an instruction on communion for those who haven't been here before. Uh, we invite all those who believe that this is the uh, spiritual presence of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ to partake. Uh, and you, when we, when I so direct, you can come in the center aisle and then take a, a cup either for yourself or for a group that you're with that is remaining behind and then go to the side, go through the side aisle back to your seats. And those on YouTube and Zoom, uh, if you would uh, take it as directed with the bread and the juice you provide for yourself, as we again can combine as one family of faith partaking in this meal, not just with ourselves, but with Christians around the world, because today is also Worldwide Communion Sunday. This Sunday, this actually, that, that whole idea of Worldwide Communion Sunday was started at Shadyside Presbyterian Church, and it's really taken root and that we really understand that this is a Sunday that, church, that churches unite together, despite denominational affiliation, uh, that we are one people in Jesus Christ partaking of partaking of this meal together. So I encourage you to have that on your mind when we uh, enjoy communion. If I see no other announcements, then let us center ourselves on the worship of God.
Let's join together in our responsive call to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When, evil do when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may go out in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up upon my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifice and shouts of joy. I will sing and make medley of the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not. O God of my salvation, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me, O Lord, O Lord, and lead me on the level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe, I believe that, that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord, let us worship God. Mike, because Mike was the first one to start clapping. I saw Haley over there. She's going like this. I, do I clap? Do I not clap? <laughs> Donna was going like this. And Never. then Sue in the back, where she was like doing a silent clap. <laughs> but thank you, Mike, for getting, you know, doing the whole thing. Never okay? be afraid to clap. But, and all the others for, uh, for putting some, you know, for clapping as well. So. <laughs> Let's go to God in unison and ask for his mercy and grace. God of mercy and grace, we celebrate the joy we have that you have redeemed us from the darkness and set your light and presence before us. Forgive us for our unrelenting tendencies to fall to sin and addiction. Help us through your spirit not to become overwhelmed, but to endure and remain steadfast.
In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Christian friends, we so often think that our sin defines us, but our def our, what defines us is that we are children of God. And God loves us so much that he redeems us and he brings us back to his path no matter what we do. So hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let's remain standing and affirm what we believe by sharing together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray that God will open our hearts and minds. Lord of light and understanding, we come to you for the ability to hear and understand your word written in, in Jesus Christ as the light that reveals your will to your people. Open us to not only hear, but to take the light into the darkness so that the world can see and know your son. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Daniel, chapter chapter 2, verses 17 to 30, in the English Standard Version. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God, for my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and might, and I have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went to Nyak, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Ariah brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, 
I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered to the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he had made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, come thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries make, made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. May the Lord bless this reading and our understanding of his most holy word. So this, this morning I had, it's easier this way. Um, this morning I have one that I think sometimes we just need one that's upbeat and fun, and I really like this one. Um, how many of you listen to K-Love, just by a show of hands? Okay, I, when I'm in working, I have K-Love on all the time. It just is, I think, really inspiring, and I love all their music that they play on there. So this, you might recognize this one then. Um, my feet are on the rock, and... Um, Sometimes I like to put the words up on the screen for you to sing along, and sometimes I like to have their faces so that you can see their, their expressions, their joy. And this one is one that doesn't have the lyrics, but I think sometimes there's a lot to get out of seeing their, who the people are and seeing the joy as they express the song. So if you know the words, sing along. I don't know why Dan picked such a long passage to read. I don't know. I'm only picking four verses, so I win. Anyway, our scripture today comes from the uh, Gospel of Mark. And, you know, when I'm thinking of the passages, I'm always thinking of to what, how far do you go and what are the messages you can uh, have in, in the course of the time, you know, of a, a worship service and a message. And I really felt, felt that the verses 21 to 25 really speaks a whole message that we need to understand. So uh, here are these words from, again, the Sermon by the Sea. Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, we say all the time, Jesus is the light of the world. And we'll look at scripture that speaks to that very thing. But when you think Jesus is the light of the world, you have to also think, what is he illuminating? He's illuminating the darkness. And sometimes we find ourselves just living in darkness and not seeking the light and fearing darkness, but not seeking the light that the darkness fears. Because God has chosen us before the foundation of the world, yet it is sin and fear that at times compels us to not leave darkness or to return to darkness. But the joy of our faith tells us that Christ is the light and will always bring us home. Now, I've talked over the course of our messages about different phobias, and, and one in particular is a nicophobia, and it's the extreme or irrational fear of the night or the darkness. Yeah, I knew this 25-year-old woman when I was in Peace Corps. She always had to sleep with light in her room, no matter how, uh, no matter what, because she had this fear of darkness. And there are people, and that's why you even have night lights at times, because oftentimes our children are have the fear of the. Uh, fear of darkness, but how many adults do as well? Why do you think we have a fear of the dark? You know, some because we see images in uh, our movies about things happening in the dark. Sometimes we, our nightmares are usually shrouded in darkness. 
and we are afraid of what happens in the dark. Now, someone said, I don't fear the dark itself. It's what happens in the dark that worries me. Well, again, what is in the dark? If you can't see, there's been times I will say, you know, when I walk into this room, especially when the lights are on, I mean, I have no uh, issues, but I, I, there are times I, I stay very late and the lights are off here and I realize I need to get something off my stand in the, uh, in the sanctuary. And I realized when I'm halfway down the aisle, did I turn the light on? Do I now go back, turn the light on, or do I proceed further? And I know nothing's going to happen, but I wonder, am I going to trip over the steps coming up, trip down the steps going down? Is something going to happen because I cannot clearly see? Some typical causes of nyctophobia, the fear of the darkness, is some is a primitive fear. You know, one of the things that, you know, primitive man had is they made light, they made fire to push back the darkness. And it's learned, it's a learned fear because their children often have that fear. You have this concept of perceived crime. More crime happens in the dark than it does in the light. And that is actually not true. More crime happens during the light than it is in the dark, but it's always that mystery of why things are happening in the alleys and the dark alleys and the dark byways. Sometimes we reflect in our own minds the trauma that happened to us, and in that reflection, there's a darkness surrounding us. You know, just a, a visual in our minds, a visual darkness behind it, and then there's always the unknown, there's always the imagined. In the absence of evidence or clarity, our minds take our imagination in the worst possible way. So here's, a, here's something I want to ask. If you look at this picture, is this a sunrise or a sunset? Think about it. How many believe it's a sunrise? Raise your hand. Okay, how many believe it's a sunset? Okay. Now, I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I know, it's my secret knowledge. But what do you prefer? If you were... If you were to shut your eyes and think, what is my preference, sunrise or sunset? What do you think you would vote? Actually, I, I, was, I was looking online about uh, surveys about this, and some say it's like a 50-50 split. Others say it's like a two-thirds sunset preference over sunrise. And they will say the reason the sunrise is, uh, doesn't rate as high is because you've got to get up. Oftentimes for a sunrise, you go, yeah, I just got to be awake at sunset and I get, ooh, isn't that pretty? But at a sunrise, I actually sometimes, depending on where I'm at, got to wake up and make sure, okay, I've got all this stuff going, but let me see the sunrise. Oh, nice. But the one on the, my uh, left is a sunset. The one on the right is a sunrise. And I'll just tell you, the first one, first picture was a sunrise. Um, uh, so... One, when you think about a sunset, you, it might be pretty because the colors are muted. There seems to be a peacefulness around it. But what follows is darkness, which is fearful. On the flip side, though, is that on a sunrise, as though it is dark, what do you see? You see the sun coming up and all the illumination occurring, and that gives you a sense of hope, a sense of salvation. Is it a surprise that Jesus rose in the morning, that Jesus is seen as connected to a sunrise as opposed to a sunset? Each morning offers lessons in light. For the morning light teaches the most basic of truths. Light chases away darkness. That what was dark is now illuminated. What you feared is now revealed. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has, has not overcome it in John 1, 5. This really speaks to uh, the power of who Jesus Christ is. That when the light comes into the world, into the dark world, in this metaphor of the world being dark, the light illuminates. And it shows us what is truly there. 
I don't know if any of you have ever read this book. It's one of my favorite books, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Joseph Conrad was Polish. He didn't even learn to speak English or read English or write English until he was 18 years old. But he did it so well, he wrote a series of books, and this is one of his most famous, Heart of Darkness. And it speaks about uh, something that happens in Africa. And Africa was the dark continent because of the mystery around it, because of violence and uncertainty, fear and loss. And that is certainly what Joseph Conrad sought to portray in the book, Heart of Darkness. He was able to choose that title because it, it, it gathered very easily all the things that he wanted to communicate. That there was no light and it was the darkness of not just the uh, atmosphere, but the darkness of the soul, of what was occurring in his own soul, the, the, the main character. Now, it says in Isaiah 9, 2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light, but those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Do we remember where we hear that elsewhere? Isn't that what is told by the angels to the shepherds when they appear to them? The light has come, the darkness is fleeing. We, are, in fact, are called to be a people of light in a world of darkness. We are called to illuminate into the world what we believe and to whom we belong. Just as Jesus Christ is the light, we, as part of, that, uh, of Jesus Christ, are called to be light to the world. Because the world is dark, the world is fearful. Now, if we look at this theme, some said, where is this? this is, you know, is this a difficult theme to develop from Scripture? It really isn't. If you ever really want to get a really quick rundown of all the major themes of the Bible, get this book. It's called uh, The Bible Book, Big Ideas Simply Explained by DK. And, and they have a whole series of books, you know, engineering. Made simple. I looked at that and said, oh, after I read this, can I be call, call myself an engineer? No, nah, I didn't think I was able to. But anyway, this does a really great job of explaining some of the big ideas from a, from a very uncomplicated way. Because as I said just recently in a sermon, scripture is pretty uncomplicated until we decide to make it much more convoluted, make it much more difficult, to make it much more complex. So we have just several verses, just a few verses in our passage today that when we look at it, it's pretty simple. Jesus said to them, one of his uh, messages was, does anyone bring in a lamp to put it under a basket or under a bed? Doesn't he set it on a stand? Now, the first thing I advise each, everyone, if you look at this passage and really want to unpack it, don't overthink it. It's like someone saying, you know, at a job interview, tell us about yourself. Uh, uh, I don't know what to say. Well, just tell us about yourself. That way it's not a, it's, this is not a trick question. This is not a trick question. When you look at this verse, Jesus is asking the simple, does anyone take a light into a room and put it under a basket? The answer is, boy, that was not a really re resounding. The answer is, no. no, no, you don't do that. I mean, why would you do that? One would set the basket on fire unless that was your goal. And then you might want to go to Kassim for pyromania. But it's not really something you would do. You bring a light into a room and you set it on the stand for illumination to reveal what's in the cracks, what's in the crannies, what is in the room that you want to be aware of. Have you ever uh, walked around your house without the lights on? You get up, need to go do something in the middle of the night, and you say, oh, I'm not going to turn on the lights. And then before you know it, you bang your knee. You hit your elbow. Somehow a wall or a, a piece of furniture has just jumped out and attacked you. Or because you, weren't, uh, you had no illumination, you did not quite remember where that piece of furniture was or where that wall is. But the light opens your eyes. It reveals things. Martin Luther King Jr. said this really thing I felt, felt profound is that darkness cannot drive out darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Just as hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. There's a great link between light and love. 
that when the light is revealed, we see people for who they are. But the joy is that God also, in the light of illumination, sees us for who we are. For it says, for Jesus says, for there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. Does that give you a sense of joy? Or does that give you a sense of dread? Nothing will be hidden. You know, it's like opening a closet and wondering how many skeletons are in there. It's fine if you're opening it and just putting another skeleton in, but what if someone else is opening it to see the number of skeletons that you might have hidden in that closet? Because we all have those skeletons, don't we? I'll just speak for myself. I know I do. But I also know that all that's revealed to God. I might not want to share that with you, but I know that God in Christ knows exactly what's in that closet. And I'll either have to repent of those sins, or those sins will be exposed. Maybe not here or now, but certainly when I stand before the throne. It is clear that that light is illuminating. God sees it. I think it's Psalm 139 says, wherever I go, God is there. If I shroud myself in darkness, God is there. He makes the darkness as if light. God sees us wherever we are, clearly and completely. Think about that the next time you decide to do something wrong. Your family, your friends, your, you know, might not know, but God is seeing clearly exactly what you're doing. And it says in James that if anyone, then if anyone knows the good they ought to do, they know what they should do, but doesn't do it, it's sin for them. I know I should do this, or I know I shouldn't do that, but I'm doing it anyway. Most sin is very deliberate. Very little sin is, oops, accidental. It says in John, 1 John 3.20, even if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. And that is where knowing that the illumination of our sin is ever present before God, where we should take comfort. Because we might condemn ourselves, but God already knows our sins. He knew our sins before we were born, yet he gave us life and he sent his son while we were yet still sinners to redeem us. That is the comfort of our faith. That despite our sinfulness, despite our darkness, clothing darkness around us, God brings light, reveals to us that he knows what we're doing, but despite that, still loves us and still calls us to himself. I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of joy. It gives me a lot of comfort that it's not dependent upon my righteousness, for if it was, I know I would stand condemned. It stands upon God's love for me as his beloved child. And that should give all of us a sense of joy. Even in the midst of a feeling of guilt because we continue to sin. And Jesus continues to say, if anyone have ears to hear, let him hear. Now, is he talking about just the reverberation of sound waves on our eardrums? You know, that's what to hear means. But I think you can use these words to hear and to listen. Uh, use, we're often ex, uh, interchange. So Jesus, I mean, Jesus could have easily said, all those who have ears, let them listen, but didn't sort of rhyme with it, hear and ear sort of rhymes. But to listen is to pay attention to the sound, to understand what that sound is. Is that a drip of the faucet that needs to be repaired? Is that my spouse calling me to do something? Is that my child crying in pain? What is that sound? I'm going to understand it. So d whether or not you want to say hear or listen is that, that not just the reverberation of sound waves on your ear that you realize I'm hearing sound, but understanding what that sound is. Those who hear, who have ears, let them hear that. Let them just use their ears more than just sound waves, but really perceive what's being said. Because when you hear and understand, you know. 
And there's, but even then, there's a great difference between knowing and understanding. You can know a lot about something, but not really understand it. Like I said, I read that DK book on big ideas made simple on engineering, and at the end of it, I said, oh, I know what this says, but I still don't understand it. Ergo, I'll never be an engineer. That often happens. But I will on a side, if you are called to salvation by God and you read scripture, it might be difficult, but you will understand it according to God's grace. And that's again, there's nothing I know from scripture that you and the, everyone in this congregation from the youngest to the oldest can't know. I have no secret knowledge. Scripture is revealed for what it is. Jesus goes on to say, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more will be added to you. You know, what Jesus is doing here in the Gospel of Mark, remember, the Gospel of Mark is really uh, very short compared to the Gospel of Matthew, which is very similar to Mark, but elaborates on a lot of this thing. And I think there are almost a chapter would go with this passage alone that we don't see in Mark, but we do see in the Gospel of Matthew. Pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more will be added to you. Again, you hear that, that adage. Confucius says, this is not that. This is actually Confucius did say this. To know what you know and what you do not know, that is true knowledge. And we've talked about that before. There's things we know, but too often we think we know something, but we don't. We gloss over it, we pass through it, and just apply what we think we know to it. But to truly understand the light of Jesus Christ, we have to go to God's word, which is the light of Jesus Christ, the light that illuminates us, and to read it and seek to know it, even in this most intricate way. If we pass over something and just say, oh, well, I don't, re I don't realize what that is, but I'll just move on, then we miss something. It's not what we know, but what we do with what we know. So when you read it, is it just let the, you know, let the image hit your eyes? Or are you really trying to understand it? And then what are you going to do with it once you do understand it? Again, Jesus uh, says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He identifies who he is. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, I don't know if that's what Jesus' foreshadowing of cell phones was all about. That's his joke. Everyone should laugh. Because don't we all have cell phones? And, and suddenly if this room went pitch black, you'd suddenly see cell phones come out and we'd all have our little flashlight. But we don't have to rely on that. We have to rely on our, the Holy Spirit within us. That Jesus is the light, and as we follow him, that light illuminates ourselves, and we now go into the world as light, as Jesus is light. Not only light that helps us to know the path, but light that illuminates those around us. Have you ever been on a hike with someone that has a, uh, has a uh, flashlight and you don't have one? Don't you rely on them for the light that shows the path? In the same way, we are that light to a world in darkness. People will follow that path if we illuminate that or not if we put it under a bushel. The light of Christ overshadows the darkness of our problems. Our direction becomes clear, our path safe, and our fears unnecessary, not just for ourselves, but to those, for those around us. Because they too can see the illumination, even if they're not carrying the light with them, but then through that understanding, they can gain the light of Christ themselves through what we set and model for them. Christ concludes this passage forever, uh, for whoever has will be given more, and, but whoever does not have, even what he uh, has will be taken away from him. That bothers a lot of people. I've got this and suddenly Jesus is going to take it? Well, remember, what we have comes from God, and if we're not using it, 
we're told God's going to take it and give it to someone who is going to use it. Because we are called to be that light in the world. And if we decide we want to put that light under the bushel, well, maybe that light can be snuffed out. One or two things will happen. If you put a light under a bushel, it's either going to catch the basket or the bushel. I mean, the basket is going to catch the basket on fire. It's going to be snuffed out because of the lack of oxygen. The Washington Post has an advertisement. If you don't get it, you don't get it. If you don't get the Washington Post, you won't get all the news of the world. But I like that, I like that because if you don't get it, you don't get it. For those who don't know Jesus Christ, they don't get it, but they won't even be aware that they don't get it. They might get irritated that we think we've got it, but, and they might be irritated that we say, if you don't get it, you don't get it. But our job is never to say that. Our job is instead is to be the good news, the great news, knowing that the Holy Spirit ensures we get it, and that we have salvation and understanding that we now extend it to all those that we come into contact with. We were having a meeting earlier this week, uh, evangelism and uh, revitalization evangelism, a little task force. And that's one of the things we were talking about, that if everyone in here were to map out everyone they know and to lay that map out, and, you know, uh, lay, and we all did that, it would be shocking how many overlayers there would be. And if we're talking about our love for Christ with those that are around us, and the people, everyone's doing the same thing, suddenly there would be, there'd be people who would hear it multiple places at multiple times, all saying, hey, I keep on hearing these people talk about their love for Christ and how Christ has done something for them, how he's provided salvation and understanding. Maybe that's something I need to pursue. But if they don't get it, how can they get, if we don't give it to them, how can they ever get it? That is what our calling is to be. Now, this is not someone I respect at all. Joseph Goebbels, he was a propaganda minister in Nazi Germany. But he, quote, he said this, and it's known as the big lie. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. If you tell it so audaciously, it's so out there, and just keep on saying it, People will come to say, oh, that must be true. Why would you say, uh, why would you, how could anyone make a lie that big? And that's what society has done. Society has done that. And we, and so many people believe it. Jesus Christ is in, in, inconsequential. The gospel doesn't mean anything. We were again looking at statistics, and in West Mifflin, the majority, the strong majority, don't go to church. The strong majority, I think we said 60 odd percent, uh, don't go to church. And this is even higher than the national average. 51 percent of the national average don't go to church. 41 percent of, uh, yeah, 41, 51 percent of our country don't go to church. 41 percent of West Mifflin, no, it's 61 percent of West Mifflin doesn't go to church. Think about that. But society would say it doesn't matter. But Romans, Paul tells us they exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is forever worthy of praise. Amen. That is what society is saying. If you want, and I'm going to have a sermon on this sometime soon, if you want to see your God, look in a mirror. That's your God. And that's what society says. But we have to, as Christians, replace the lies with truth. We have to stand boldly and say, this is not what God is saying. This is not what God is intending. This is not what God has called us to. We, as God's people, need to proclaim the light that is coming to the world by being light ourselves. And if we're not doing that, then we are, in essence, allowing the lie to go unchecked. Grace and truth are one. We can't have grace without the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. We can't have truth without grace that helps us understand that. 
When God said, let there be light, and there was light, he brought Christ into the world. The illumination of the sun and the moon, that came later. It's the light when he spoke light. That is the illumination. So Christ has already always been here. And darkness has feared that light from that moment in time. The chaos of darkness was pushed back and light came into the world. And the light shines in the darkness, but still the darkness does not comprehend it. Because it wants to shroud itself. It wants to hide itself. It wants to think, I can do whatever I want. And the darkness of my heart, and no one will know. But for God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts and give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That is what we've been given as Christians. That we have the light of knowledge in our hearts that reveals who God is through Jesus Christ. And we are called to share that with the world. So let the light of Christ that we carry within us drive away the darkness of fear and sadness. But there is a lot of fear and sadness out there. But when we share the light in our hearts, that drives not only the fear and darkness away from us, but it shares that same joy with those around us. For the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Christian friends, we do not have to be afraid. For we have received the light of Jesus Christ in our hearts. We know who Christ is, and we have the joy of sharing that truth with all that have ears to hear and eyes to see. Let us share the, that light with the world. And we say as we come to this table that we are asking God to illuminate us to knowing that Christ is coming back and to waiting patiently until he does so. And until that great and wonderful day that we share the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord, once again with eyes that are, eyes that can see, ears that can hear, and hearts ready to receive. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Christian friends, we gather at this table to proclaim that Jesus Christ is coming. We gather at this table to unite with Christians around this world. That wherever we are and wherever they are, we are connected one with another. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we ask your blessings on, these, on this meal. For this is the joyful meal of the marriage feast. Bless us as we seek. For they will come from the east and the west and the north and the south to sit at table to partake of this meal. So bless us as we do so, knowing that we are united with them as we wait for that great and glorious day when your son returns. In your son's holy name, amen. Christian friends were told on the night in which our Lord and Savior was betrayed. After giving thanks, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. It says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood for the remission of sins. For as often as you drink of it, do so in, rem in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christian friends, let us partake of this wondrous and joyful meal.
Christian friends, this is the body of Christ. Take a knee. This is the blood of Christ. Take a drink. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father, we come to you knowing that you love us, knowing that you are present with us each and every day. And we thank you for the fact that we as a community of faith can seek and speak to that truth as we are connected one to another. Lord, we ask your blessings to be upon us. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our ability to share with you the truth or share with this community the truth of Jesus Christ. We ask your blessings to be upon us, O oh Lord, upon those in our community. Be with Michael Beck. He's attended worship here and he, a number of us know him, but he just has ongoing life struggles. We ask your presence to be with the Costa family, who, you know, Jen is in the hospital with an infection. Be with um, Jeff and the rest of the family as they support her and they love her, but let her recover well. And we just thank you for her cheerful disposition, even as she is still sick. We ask your blessings on the Petruzzi family. Uh, Nancy going through some serious health issues, her daughter Kim with stage four cancer, and John being there to seek to support them all. We ask your blessings on Kate Mincing's friend Jay and his wife Sandy. Jay has a possible AL, ALS diagnosis. Uh, we don't know what exactly it is, but we ask you to be there for them and with them. Lord, we also ask your blessings on uh, Terry Nicholson's family, her father Steve, who the cancer is spreading, but it's being not as bad as they thought it would. Uh, give him the uh, ability to overcome this, if not physically, mentally, to be a presence to his children and to his wife, even in the midst of the challenge he faces. Lord, be with Carol, uh, Terry's mom, who give her strength to support her husband and Terry and Mark, uh, Mark, Terry's brother, as they support them both. We thank you that uh, Pearl's back pain is getting better. Uh, and we ask you to be with her son, Bob, as he is recovering from a fall, from the fall that, put, that injured his back. And we rejoice that uh, her brother-in-law, Robert Montgomery, though he still has heart issues, the leukemia seems to have uh, been taken care of. Be with Dick Snyder. Give, her, give him your strength as he faces issues. And be with Belle as she supports him. Be with Pam Mervis' friend Jordan as they face, uh, the, as Jordan faces the struggle of having a form of cancer that's treatable but not cur curable. And Lord, we ask you to be with Al uh, Adeline McGuire, Al Sashworth's granddaughter. Be with Pat and Roger Nichols. Be with Bernie Hollis and Tom Fox. Lord, be with uh, Rich Mills' brother-in-law, Bob, and his friend, college, room, uh, college friend, Rocky. We ask you to continue to be with Tony, Belinda's friend, and the teacher she's teaching for. But it looks like he might be able to come back in the spring. Be with her former student, Nick, who is still struggling with a, a bad car accident. Lord, we ask you to be with... Uh, The cousins of uh, Lori Broadwater, uh, one who is recovering from a car accident and the other who is continuing to suffer uh, uh, illness. 
We thank you that Bob Hawk's surgery went well, and he is at home, he's recovering, and he uh, will soon be going to outpatient uh, rehab. Be with, uh, the, be with uh, Andy Wonka as his leg has been hurt, and uh, he bumped it, and it got infected. Be with him. Be with Amy Hines, uh, Nancy Ritchie's daughter, who has ongoing health issues and uh, is continuing to address those issues. Continue to be with the Benders family, uh, their brother Dan and uh, their uh, niece Amy and her daughter as they're recovering and be with Lily and their friend who has, uh, who's recovering from skin grafts. Lord, we rejoice that Jackie Kanak, uh, Tom and Carrie Richards friend, the surgery was successful, the prognosis is positive, the test results are good, we thank you for that. Lord, we ask your blessings on all those who are depressed and anxious, those who are struggling with life decisions, looking for new employment, um, uh, having issues uh, at home and at work, and give them your strength and let them know even in their private hurt and pain you are there with them. You are the light that helps them get through this darkness. Give us all the hope and the assurance that only comes when we turn ourselves to you. Be with our nation. Uh, help us to get past this political divide knowing that that's always existed almost since our founding, but at the same time, let there be civility and kindness reign more than anger and hatred. Lord, let us be a model. Let us be an example. Let us help in everything we say and everything we do the truth that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Again, just got the names Jade and Marianne, the cousins of Lori Broadwater. We ask your blessings on them. Lord, give us in all things your strength and your presence each and every day as we seek you and as we pray the prayer your son taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christian friends, are offering uh, baskets or plates are in the back. For those who have already laid your offerings, we thank you. And those who, as we leave, if you'd like to lay your offerings again, we thank you. And those on YouTube and uh, Zoom, if you'd like to send them in again. We appreciate these offerings as we seek to be a light within West Mifflin, pushing back the darkness, proclaiming Jesus Christ to all that have ears to hear and eyes to see. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for these gifts and thank you for your presence in our lives. Be with us in every possible way so that we can be the illumination that you have called us to be in this wonderful world. We ask all of this in your son's holy name. Amen.
Christian friends, as we leave this place, let us leave as light unto the world. For God in Christ is a light that has been spoken to this world, and it's out there, but we as his people, we as his followers are called to be that light to our family and friends and all that we meet, so that they hear the message each and every day that Jesus Christ alone is Lord. Let's go and share that wonderful news. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the companionship of the Holy Spirit and the love of God, be with us each and every day, now and always.